Now I would like to move on to new insights in the state of Georgia. So if you could welcome Ian Perry and Dion Lafont and Dave Prickshot of the Department of Industries and Ocean. They will tell you about new insights in the state of Georgia, emerging results in the CFO science, people of science, and people of the community. Thank you very much, Laura. I know it's a long morning. One last talk before lunch. The usual joke about the only thing between you and lunch is me. Um, but I think this, and, and I'd also certainly like to uh, th express my thanks to the organizers for the invitation to make this presentation. It's actually, I think, very well placed because I think you will see that we're now beginning to bring together, or at least in the presentation that I will give, you will hear echoes of several of the things we've heard in the various panels and the individual presentations that occurred uh, this morning and yesterday. So, if you like, consider us as moving towards synthesis or moving towards this afternoon's discussion. Um, uh, I'm here, of course. Deanne is not. Uh, and Dave Creekshot is a little less melancholy this morning. And uh, hopefully he will remain that way after I finish my presentation. Um, so let me step back one and give you some idea of context or motivation for this, other than the fact that Brian and Dick have now retired until we can actually do some ecosystem work. Uh, DFO does not yet have an, uh, an ecosystem plan. DFO has not yet converged on its um, ecosystem approach to manage, managing human interactions with uh, a marine system. But there are several elements that we expect to be there. Uh, this is one, and it has got five or so uh, uh, characteristics to it. Characterize and assess the ecosystem, establish objectives, indicator thresholds, management strategies, monitoring, evaluation. Now, those of you that are um, uh, part of the, the NOAA scene down here will recognize many of these elements are similar to your integrated ecosystem assessment. Our um, ecosystem research initiative for the Strait of Georgia dealt with three of these, and those are the gold stars. So I've given ourselves gold stars for uh, working on three of these objectives. And our um, main themes then for our program uh, were identified as, so the main the overall theme is understanding how the system works and how we might develop a, a, a management approach in an integrative or ecosystem framework. First one is understanding how the system works. Second one is identifying what's driving change on the street and how these drivers themselves might change in the future. And then the third one is to develop science-based management decision-making tools. Here's our definition of what we're calling the Strait of Georgia. Um, and uh, basically we've taken a liberal view, but strictly speaking, that's the Strait of Georgia, of course, Strait of Juan, Acuca, et cetera. Um, basically, our study area, the core study area, was anything eastward of the outer edge of the Strait of Juan de Fuca up to the northern edge here of the uh, Strait of Georgia. We did include, uh, we didn't purposefully exclude Puget Sound, and it was left up to the individual project. So, obviously, for things like circulation modeling, Puget Sound had to be there just to get the balances right. Um, for some of the contaminants work, which I'll touch on at the end, is our kind of business discussion. That, uh, that work was done across the border as well. Similarly, with the um, fjords on the eastern side, they were not necessarily excluded, and some projects did use them, but it wasn't part of the core elements of the program. And in a nutshell, if this is our program design, it sort of resembles, for those of you that might have been part of the GOVEC program, uh, it was, uh, um, resembles that. We had three sort of core elements. One was data analysis, which I've already referred to as data archaeology. We put a big effort on trying to dig up as much existing data as we could and apply some an analyses to those data. We had a fair effort in uh, numerical modeling and uh, working up developing some ecosystem indicators. And we had a limited effort on field work. Field work can be very expensive. We didn't have much money. Um, what we chose to do, and I alluded to this yesterday, I think, was that we targeted on, uh, ongoing team monitoring programs, and then as a result of what was coming out of our data analysis and numerical modeling, the information gaps, we tried to fund projects which would go and try and fill some of those gaps. Now, in the time that I have, so I've been on somewhat less than 30 minutes or so, uh, this project involved 50 scientists, approximately, five years. 
So it's obvious in that time that I can't touch on everything. So what I, I'm going to do is, I see Laura smiling, because she says, please don't touch on anything. Uh, what I'm going to do is essentially take a, a, a black stone and skip it over a, a smooth pond. And it's going to be touching on different um, studies as I go. I'm not going to go into any depth. Any one of them could be a whole 10, 20 minute presentation. Uh, and so you can ask the details, you can ask me the details afterwards if you like. The other thing that's done, that much, most of the work that I will show to you is actually been uh, submitted to a dedicated issue of programs in oceanography, so that there are manuscripts for all the presentations, all, all the, most of the elements I'm going to present coming out. In addition, we have several projects which we funded, which are still working through their um, write-up phase, and won't be part of that dedicated issue, but will come out in the normal course of scientific process. So I want to take Buzz Hollings' point of view from last night of taking, if you like, the helicopter view. And I want to start off, actually, you know, I, this talk was prepared before Buzz spoke, uh, but I followed Buzz Hollings' rule of hand, so no more than five, if I can do that, or six kinds of elements. And um, I, in general, I want to talk about very generally now what some of the processes are, the general processes are that uh, that make the Strait of Georgia work, quote unquote. Uh, and so these are six enrichment, initiation of plankton blooms, retention, concentration, touched on that, some of that question yesterday about aggregating into above background level, hot spots, if you like, trophic dynamics, and then near shore and benthic habitat dynamics. And again, because of time, I'm only going to touch on the three that are in blue and start off with enrichment. So enrichment is the addition of nutrients to the Strait of Georgia. The input of nutrients are basically by intermediate and deep water inflows. In addition, of course, nutrients come in from terrestrial sources. And the, the nutrients in the surface waters then are replenished largely by tidal and wind mixing and by the general estuarine flow within the strait. Dave Mathis, Paul Harrison, uh, a decade ago, did what I think is a really nice paper. I looked at nutrient balances. So basically, the main sources of nitrogen are, uh, they found, are about 10 times greater than anthropogenic sources. The total primary productivity, therefore, in the Strait of Georgia is likely to be relatively insensitive to moderate changes in nitrogen because the ambient concentrations are relatively high. And a similar conclusion was reached by Olivier Rich for phosphate silicate of the UDCC system. So the consequence is that the variations uh, in nutrient inputs to the Strait of Georgia, um, largely from the offshore, from the, the natural sources, are likely to influence productivity at longer, if you like, the table time scale. So the kinds of nutrients are basically dominated by changes in nutrients in the offshore waters. On the other hand, the variations in nutrient inputs to the upper productive la layers are likely going to be influencing productivity at the interannual time scale. And these are most of the group because these are most likely uh, controlled by local wind stress and then secondarily by the strength of the estuarine circulation. And Dick of English, Rick Thompson, and others have done some nice papers recently which have suggested that the weak winds in spring of 2007 may have reduced the surface mix layer and the productivity of the plankton, leading to the poor uh, salmon and herring herring marine survival 2009, which then didn't come back. In, 20, uh, in 2007, which didn't come back in 2009. The second process I want to touch on is what we call initiation, or processes that initiation that initiate the phytoplankton blooms in the Strait of Georgia. Now, John Newton yesterday did a really nice uh, description of the interaction between mixing and stability and how that affects plankton blooms. So basically, that's what this line says: it's the interaction of these processes. Susan Allen, as a, as a student at the University of British Columbia uh, Oceanography Department in Vancouver, has done a model of the timing of the spring bloom. And their model suggests that the timing of the spring bloom is controlled mostly by local winds and then secondarily by cloud cover. With a model and with wind information, cloud information, you can then back out and reconstruct the timing of the spring bloom over a historical period. And the long-term mean date for the spring bloom in the Strait of Georgia is the 25th of March. However, this, uh, this is year day 85, but it can vary by up to six weeks in any particular year. 
And the, the brief construction of this then suggests that the peak blue date is estimated to a very, with about a decadal periodicity. It was earlier or later in the 70s and currently, and it was earlier in the 90s. But perhaps maybe even more interesting or more important maybe than that long-term change is this last line here, is that the interannual variability of the blue date itself has increased. Now, you should be thinking about the following top line tonight about increasing variability. Now, I'm not going to say that's what happens here. But, uh, so here's the, here's the picture of what that looks like. So you can see the kind of the, the U shape of process in terms of the, uh, the sub, if you like, the average timing of the spring bloom. And uh, this is what it looks like recently with this much greater interannual variability between much earlier blooms than we've had models. Remember, these are model data, so I can't say that we've seen. Then it's been modeled up to 1970. Uh, or since 1970, and about uh, similar kinds of late dates. Here's, here's the year day, and they equate to the end of March and sometime in April. Um, now, in terms of the trophic lab, how the, the next question, of course, is if we have to get this, this uh, packaging of lower trophic material up to the higher trophic level. Zoltanson, our key mediator of that process, Dave Marcus has done a great job rifling through people's uh, filing cabinets doing the data archaeology on Zolkinson. And this, in a nutshell, is his uh, synthesis of his 90-page paper on this. So, variability in Zolkinson since 1990, he um, relates to large and local-scale processes. The large-scale uh, process dominated by the North Pacific Gyro Oscillation. And thank you to Richard. I, you now know, it was on, you saw it this morning, you heard it yesterday. I don't need to explain what the NPGO is. Uh, positive correlation there. In terms of the local scale, they're mostly dominated by uh, temperature anomalies through the water column with a negative correlation. The general processes controlling zooplankton appear to be related to exchange with the outer coast and changing in the timing of life history then. This is that the warmer water causes the zooplankton to, uh, life history essentially to speed up. So they tend to appear in the upper part of the strata towards the earlier when conditions are warmer. They match, mismatch with the timing of salmon coming out of the river. And in this case here, the zooplankton variations they found were relics were related positively but weakly with survival anomalies of salmon and herring in the strait of Georgia. Salmon here being Togo Chinook and Sakai. Now we've talked a little bit about these kinds of ecosystem models. This is an ecopath with ecosystem model that they pre-chart the image developed. Um, this is just kind of the, the icon showing the different connections and the different species groups. Um, it's nicely divided up into a benthic source food web and a pelagic source food web, which begins to uh, interconnect somewhere about the middle trophic levels here. But this is, I think, think of this as kind of a laboratory. You can play games with it, you can explore it. There are a lot of problems with these kinds of models, uh, and those are well known. But, you know, as we said yesterday, all models are wrong. Some are more wrong than others, but they're tools. Really, you need to think of models as tools. Well, what one can do when we have a model like this is, and once the model is all balanced, so that the model outputs are as balanced as well as one can with the reference or observed time series, we can essentially treat that like a, uh, a, linear, a linear regression and look at the residuals. So if one backs up the residuals from this model uh, when it's with as balanced as well as one can get, we get a pattern that looks like this. Now, the solid line is the back calculated or backed out residual. There's a number of ways that that solid line can be interpreted. Uh, it could be differences in spatial distributions among the different species. It could be something with the tuning pair of parameters that are not quite right. Or, as a, a, a third way, is that it can be interpreted as some kind of a lower production forcing function, something that um, if, if the productivity at the lower trophic, the lowest trophic levels were like this, the model would balance or would match the observations exactly. So that's the, uh, 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 and you can see it's got kind of a pattern where there's the cable variability through about 1990, uh, and then post-1990 it's dominated by trends with still some evidence of perhaps the cable variability. 
Now you've been looking at this long enough, you can see that I, uh, uh, we've overlaid on this. These circles are the, um, the wind anomalies in the uh, uh, spring and summer from Vancouver Airport. They're inverted, so we can go with weak winds up here and stronger winds down there. Um, it's suggestive that maybe there might be something going on in terms of the long-term productivity of the Strait of Georgia food web, and maybe it's correlated with winds. I'm only going to go that far because this needs to be taken as a hypothesis that perhaps should be looked at for more work, not an explanation. But it's interesting. So then we ask, well, what sort of drivers act on? So if that's how the Strait of Georgia works, what sort of drivers are acting on the Strait of Georgia? And to look at this, we assembled uh, over 100 time series for the Strait of Georgia that we could, running from 1970 to 2010. We organized those into a Gipster model for so drivers, to pressures, to space, the impact, to response. When one does that, uh, so um, we then sorted those 100 time series and we threw out any time series which did not have continuous information from 1972 to, to 2010. That left us with 37 time series uh, organized in this kind of a framework from 1970 to 2010. And those are listed here. So drivers and pressures on this side, states and impacts on this side, organized now into two rows, natural and human. And the, the, uh, the usual suspects are all here, Northern Oscillation Index, El Nino Index, GDO, NPGO, wind speed, air temperature, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, over here, spring bloom timing, sockeye salmon, survival rate from Chilco, herring, uh, the, the pink salmon, chum salmon, harbor seal, killer whale, et cetera, et cetera. Down here, we have Chinook hatchery releases, coho hatchery releases, recreational fishing efforts, human population, and over this side, we've got all the catch data, uh, the various commercial catch information and um, recreational catch information. So we then subject these data to a uh, fairly high-powered multivariate statistical uh, technique called redundancy analysis. Uh, so we have 15 natural and human drivers. These are the explanatory variables. And we looked at, uh, for the statistical relationships with these 22 state impact or response variables. Now, redundancy analysis is essentially the combination of uh, the multiple linear regression with the principal component analysis. Um, and to my amazement, when this was when, I, when these results were done, uh, if we come up with six, so but I think you're really onto something with holding the rule of hand or something. Else. I might know that, but there's six. There's three natural and three human variables. The natural ones are sea surface temperature, wind speed, and the North Pacific Gyre oscillation. Um, I, I kind of remind you again of Dave Atkinson's analysis completely independently of the Zolpicin, where he found that the NPGO and temperature were important driving variables. You don't see Zolpicin in here because it didn't have sufficient data from 1970 onwards. The three human variables were human population, recreational fishing effort, and the number of Chinook salmon released from the hatchery in the state of Georgia. Now next, uh, so that these six variables are sufficient to describe the regime-like behavior of the whole system in the state of Georgia. So this is axis one and redundancy axis two, and we get three groupings with the years here with the obvious, obvious transitions among these three groups. Now these don't, these don't match up exactly with what we might think of as the canonical uh, regime shift years for the state of Georgia. And that's because we have human information and we have catch information, all of which smear the, uh, have multiple age groups, if you like, and smear the um, purely annual uh, environmental information. If one does this with just the environmental drivers, the natural drivers, the, the uh, separate, the year breaks match quite nicely with the, the kind of thing that Nate comes up with with for regime shifts in the Great and the uh, Northeast Pacific. Now, the next slide is a little bit complicated, but let me try and just work you through. These six uh, variables can be put into a probabilistic causal network, also called, called a Bayesian network or a Bayesian belief network, essentially to generate 
of an index or a predictor of regime shift. When you do that, you come up with a time series that looks like this. So these shaded bars are the regime shift years with their uncertainty. So when one does this kind of analysis, you get a year where the regime shift occurred, but there's also an uncertainty around it. Which means to say that anywhere within this set of years, the regime shift might have occurred in a similar nature here. Now, interestingly, you can see that there's sometimes when this regime shift index seems to match quite well with uh, um, the regime shift years, and sometimes when it's maybe a little more scattered. But if you look at it and simply ask, if we just take it in a greater than 50%, less than 50% uh, context, and do a chi square test on a, a two by two contingency table, basically come up with that this index, a, a probability value of greater than 50% of this index, is a significant predictor of a potential regime shift. Now, you really have to be careful with people who stand up here and give you tons and tons of high power statistics. <laughs> because there's a problem with, so this is quite convincing in terms of its demonstration of the process. But, this is also used the same data that this that were that the model was built on. So this is not an yeah. independent test of the data. Uh, these two symbols over here for I think 2008, 2009, the unfilled ones, are the model predictions for years which are not included in building the in building the model. So we need a few more years to see what the predictive power of this model actually is. But if, if there is it's suggesting that those six variables have a strong predictive ability, at least for the large scale changes in the straight torture. So let me move on then. We have a number of very specific uh, projects that looked at management related indicators for the straight torture. One of them is the, uh, is the strength of the uh, herring. So the relationships in this case between herring and the timing of the spring bloom. So I've shown you that there can be quite a lot of timing in the spring bloom. In this case, this is the work by Jake Schweiger. He found that if the herring spawn three weeks prior to or up to the date of the spring plankton bloom, is that the, uh, the uh, young of the year index for the herring productivity was higher. If it spawned too early or too late, there was a less of a match and the herring productivity declined. Now, in terms of coho salmon, we also had a look at the predictors of early marine survival for coho salmon in the Strait of Georgia. This complicated figure, you, uh, this was, uh, you saw this big yesterday with Julie and uh, Nate talk. This is a, um, a Bayesian network analysis or a probabilistic causal network of all of the relationships that might, that for which we had data, that might determine early marine survival of hatchery and early marine survival of wild coho. Now, these are not simulation models. These are probabilistic models which basically say, given a certain condition, the state of one variable, what's the probability of getting a range of conditions in the other variable? But uh, they are really good at being able to sort through potential indicators. You come up with a table like this, which lists, the, if you like, the diagnostic value or predictive value for all of the potential indicators that went into this uh, network. The three best ones are two zooplankton um, indicators and the biomass of herring. And uh, uh, the value of this is that if you can't measure each of these, you, and you can, all you've got is ENSO, you can see what the predictive power of ENSO would be in this network. And the conclusion from this study here was that hatchery coho survival is likely maximized and the negative impacts on wild coho will be minimized when the hatchery coho are released during what might be called better ocean conditions, those being negative PDO and negative ENSO. Maybe not surprising. That sort of, you know, you think about it, people that work on this know that when the conditions are better, things are going to be better overall. But again, to have an independent analysis that brings out these three potential <laughs> indicators is, uh, is, is useful. And one more of these sorts of uh, uh, um, detailed studies. This is work that Jim Irvine has done. He looked at the early marine survival of coho in the Strait of Georgia based on the coated wire tag releases from the 1980s onwards. Statistical analysis, so we looked at the tag releases from hatcheries and one wild stock in the Strait of Georgia. 
They looked at the variables ocean entry year, mean small weight, and release date. And among those, year of ocean entry had by far the strongest effect on coho survival. And we saw that a lot yesterday. The coho survival rates have gone down over time. The best model differed among the hatcheries, implying that there's some, uh, something going on with location-specific differences in timing and size, uh, in size and timing of release. And that while hatchery and wild coho survival trends were similar, the wild stocks always seem to be better. So the conclusion uh, from Jim's study is that releasing coho smoke in batches, if you like, during the outmigration period of the higher surviving wild coho smoke would have the best chance of improving the survival of a hatchery. Rather than throwing all your hatchery smoke out at one time, spread them out over the period of the wild smokes are out there, basically a sort of risk hedging strategy. And Jim argued for an experimental approach using hatcheries to evaluate density dependent, dependent effects on salmon, cola salmon growth and survival, which perhaps might be something to consider with some community. Um, I've got time over that left. Okay, maybe, um, maybe I'll skip through. I, I, we have done some other work looking at the development of potential um, thresholds uh, for ecosystem responses. Um, and if you want to get some time questions, maybe I'll, I'll address that in questions. But maybe I'll skip over the next two ones. And let's talk a little bit about the future. So in terms of the future, there is some predictability due to the uh, combination of large scale and local influences. The Northeast Pacific drives the low frequency variable of Strait of Georgia, large scale effects. These show in uh, blue the, and red is the uh, time series that's aligned key transects to the outer uh, to station P on the, in the oceanic North Pacific. And, uh, and the blue line is the depth average temperature anomaly in the Strait of Georgia. In terms of local scale effects, the Fraser River flow drives the sea surface salinity in the Strait of Georgia. Uh, and this is both Strait of Georgia salinity and Fraser River runoff, which match fairly well as well. What, are the, what do these models, physical models, project for the future? They project, at least in the uh, medium term, a continuation of the observed uh, depth average warming that we've seen over the past 30, 40 years. The start of upwelling off the west coast of Vancouver Island has been occurring later over the past 50 years and the duration of the upwelling season has become shorter. And we can expect modification to the freshwater discharge seasonal cycle because of the warming climate. And again, we've seen that, the balance between a, a snowmelt dominated river flow and a river and a rainfall, or rainfall dominated runoff river, um, uh, river flow damage. The other thing, of course, is what we just finished talking about, is that there are human processes that are going, that are going on in the Strait of Georgia. This is work by Peter Ross. This NILA test used uh, harbor seals as sentinels for contaminants in the Strait of uh, Georgia and the Puget Sound. So he had seals from Puget Sound and the Strait of Georgia. And uh, looked at the uh, PCB loads in those in seal tissue. And this is the pattern that he's finding. It's a, uh, an exponential decline uh, over the last uh, 30 years or so, which he attributes to the effectiveness of regulation. So there is hope for contaminants if we can regulate them properly. Now, industries like fishers, I should say, are very good at getting around regulation. And so we ban one set of chemicals, they find another one. So in this case, the flame retardants, the polybrominated diphenyl ethers, have been increasing all over. They appear to make a stable, stable loss, uh, uh, level loss a little bit. So in terms of governance, governance, what does all this mean? It means that the pressures on the Strait of Georgia have become increasingly dominated by human impacts. Although the environmental changes remain important, climate likely dominates the interannual variability. But at the longer scale, both climate and human impacts are going to be important. Uh, the Strait has become increasingly dominated by pelagic species. We don't talk much about the density convertebrates, but uh, they appear to be doing generally all right, at least fisheries are within historic ranges. These changes are driven by a combination of large-scale processes, represented in this case nicely by the NPGO, and local-scale processes, temperature, wind, exchanges with the outer coast water masses. These keep coming up in a number of studies, completely done completely independently, often with independent data. 
And I'm going to finish up basically where I started my talk yesterday with kind of a capsule statement of the idea of a pre-first um, focus on resilience. So whether these changes are bad basically depends on what we want for the Strait of Georgia. And the goal should be to retain the natural ability of the Strait to adjust to and recover from these changes. And we're beginning to, uh, um, I think, understand or at least uh, elucidate some of the elements of an ecosystem approach to the Strait of Georgia, such as what are the anthropogenic stresses, how does the Strait work, indicators, uh, thresholds, which I didn't tell you about, but they are there, tools, spatial management. I didn't talk about some of the sandlands work that's been done, identifying important habitats for sandlands, and then um, identifying uh, and perhaps revolving some of the, the significant uh, knowledge gaps. And so with that, uh, we can go for lunch, and, or we can, I can answer some questions. But I'm going to use Dave here as well as my co-author for uh, help with some of the questions. So thank you. When we were discussing June Irvine's results, we recommended that uh, we get better survival of um, coho smelts from hatcheries if you send them out the same time as the uh, natural run. But another possible option would be to send them out early as a decoy. Hatcheries send the goats in the new well anyway. That's not for me. I would comment on that. The, the interesting thing, though, is that uh, it kind of relates to Jim's second point, was that the uh, plea for site of identity dependent effect. So we might think that releasing them was the point was not to release hatchery fish at it in one thing, but to spread them out, hedge your bet, perhaps decrease the density the and interaction that might be going on. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm not. Good, good point. <laughs> So, so my question is, what is this comprehensive study cost, and how long did it take? So the study was uh, five years, and uh, we received a uh, total for five years was one point five million dollars. Canadian, which is about the same now as not when we started. Which um, for us is a lot of money, but relative, I think, to what we've accomplished and to uh, to the amount of work that's done, it's getting. I could go on, it could go on about the funding and the work that so could go through, but we won't do that. Any questions or comments? Yeah. Okay. Um, Jim, do you have Bill and then Mark and then turn to the screen for that. Um, Ian, you had noticed a comment about how we should change the country practices, so how they should change the practices. Will they really do that? Or are they able to do that? In your opinion. Now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this has been a hot bottom for the last five years for sure. You might not have to discuss for a while, but the world could potentially, you know, shut the batteries on and off and see when it's a signal. Um, certainly, the uh, government right now is really concerned about any kind of noise. So I think that makes it more difficult, but. Um, you know, certain strategies kind of worked on on a, on a more localized scale where we develop the science and try and try to find different ideas. And we sell that to the local citizen groups, the First Nations, and the Sports Fisheries Advisory Board. And uh, I think once we come up with essential options that's science based, and we have the support little interest groups that we bring it up to government. But we have far more success trying to do something like that. So I've seen that happen in a couple of places just in the last five years where you know, we've sort of brought it up from the grassroots up and it sort of works so well. But on a big scale, I think that's been a lot of effort.
So one of the uh, projects, take a look at the 14 programs that there was, you know, spread a third proposal. <coughs> I think there's a lot of frustration, as Mel said, we've talked about, we've, we've thought about this for 20 years, between the enhanced program, the science grant, and others. So there's actually a project that agrees to reduce the production into the spread of Georgia by 75% for three years to look at the effect on gas Now it's short term. And it's not to zero because they have to maintain the brood stock and their opinion. And that. so, I mean, if we can return to that program and, you know, get agreement on the whole package again. And the secret seems to be exactly what Mel said is if it's independently developed and it's science based, then people are all prepared to give it a shot because we really aren't doing anything very positive with our actual program at this time. And to that, Jim talked about breaking into chunks. I would say we're losing them after a while, too. Because I'm not sure now with nothing, so you're not losing anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not quite that extreme, but you might as well be quite vocal in this case. Okay. 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 Uh, Mark and then Ramana and then Frank. Oh, you're good. Okay. Mark. I just wanted to add on the uh, cost that Ian uh, mentioned about the 1.5 million. That's the New dollars that the government provides to do this, but there are some ongoing skills programs that rely on ESO or Coast Guard platforms and other sorts of funding to do this. So that 1.5 million is just the new money we're getting. Uh, but if you're trying to get new vessels to come in and do this, then you have to have a ship plan to do this whole time. <laughs> well, uh, possibly even more because the ship time is about uh, 15k a day. So just imagine how many days you have to do this and that can boost up your cost. Which, which is why we limited our sort of work on the field program side because they can very quickly dump up all our existing and new dollars. I have uh, a one and a half minute over. I just had a question where I guess the game that wants to be used. Do you have a comment from the forum that maybe you want to share either in written form uh, with people who call it the as to um, what you know, why some of these were shut down? Uh, and then maybe how we have to you know, maybe ask the moderators to maybe look at some of the other things that they have to do. Do you have any comments on that? Maybe there's some key lessons about why and how we can explain the uh, question of the uh, long-term data that's probably not involved in collecting that. Uh, yeah, I, I think there's, uh, there may be some overlap with, with, with Ian on this because he did look at uh, some different uh, data sets in, in the modeling work that, that he presented about the uh, uh, about, uh, discovery analysis and the ecopathy of the stuff. The ecosystem stuff is, is more reliant on uh, stock assessment data sets that are extant and that's it, in a small way, it is data archaeology, uh, and, and sometimes it's, it's going to uh, outside things like Christmas bird count data, which is there if you use that as an index of, of, of changes in bird abundance. It could uh, leverage things like uh, data that has been collected by local organizations. There's no reason why that can't go in there, but of course. The question has to become is, is that data being collected at the scale at which your model is being resolved? So in this case, the trade charges. And sometimes it takes a little bit of work to cobble that together. So it's kind of a cost benefit analysis when you go in and look at it that way. But it was just, in this process, it was an evil exercise to just see that, you know, that Christmas bird count data, which had been collected for years and years and years, was something that could be interpreted in a meaningful way by a marine model there. Um, in terms of, a broader question, I think Ian might have some observations on, on the data time series that you use because, you know, it's just the difficulty there of finding continuous data sets from a long enough time horizon to give you contrast. Just real quick, somebody has a microphone, please so hold it up. Sure. <laughs> so there, there are better data from 2000 onwards. Um, and I think the initiative, the poster that Brian's standing in front of back there that Isabel's involved in to provide a clearing house for data, even if it's just metadata, it would be great because finding the custodians of these data are really difficult. 
Uh, the total of data from 2000 onwards is that they're too short, of course, to, to show large-scale low-frequency changes. So in the work that I described there, we uh, restricted it to uh, only those data that had values from the year 1970 onwards. But better data from 2000 onwards, so you know, the situation is getting better. I just wanted to uh, comment on the willingness of uh,